our focus on being interdisciplinary. It's that we, I think, generally believe that having area, I mean, having having specialization is great and always in-depth knowledge, we should never devalue that, but at the same time, um, we can't be siloed into spaces where we don't have conversations across different disciplines. We also must acknowledge that we are, as of today, being faced with some very critical challenges. How the interest uh, of Indian students in Hurti has been growing year by year. So somebody hosted me, a student hosted me for an interview in 2017. Um, this friend of mine was, I think, then thinking of doing India-centric conferences organized by Hurti. Uh, and, and now um, that happens uh, a lot more frequently. There's so many more alums. How we deal with one another as human beings uh, in ways that are very complex and if we had answers to that, we would not have the field of political science. And so I think um, this ongoing interest has kept me engaged even today. Hello, Dr. Shubha. It is really a pleasure to have you with us. Um, there's so many uh, network capital folks who go to Hurti and have a phenomenal time studying there. So it's great to speak to a professor there. Welcome to Network Capital. Thank you so much, Oskarsh. It's a pleasure to be here and share my experiences of Hurti with you. Um, you've had a really international academic career. Um, tell us a bit about your, uh, your journey and how you ended up at Hurti. Um, this is a great question. So I am right now an assistant professor of international relations at the Hurti School. And so honestly, my journey and interest in international affairs, global politics, uh, began at a surprisingly young age, I would say, looking back um, in, in school from class nine, class 10, when we had one chapter on world history, I would always be interested in like, oh, wow, how come we had world wars? And then we set up a global institution like the UN and tried so hard to sort of bring all the countries of the world together. And that sort of like stayed as an interest with me through my years growing up. And I think um, in my undergraduate degree, I interestingly did not take political science. I actually did my BA in English literature at Lady Sri Ram College. But what I realized through my three years of coursework was whatever I was drawn to was the political analysis of texts. So actually at the end of those three years, I decided I, I'm not going to continue with literature as my main interest. And I applied to programs in international relations for my masters. So I ended up doing a masters and an MPhil at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. But I think the very, very rich experience I had through this process of learning in India was the understanding that if you really want to be a very sound expert in international relations, global affairs, you also need to have a little bit of international exposure. You also need to try and immerse yourself in others' perspectives, in global perspectives. So for me, continuing in this field, I decided I had to do a PhD internationally. So I applied for many PhD programs around the world, quite frankly, and in the end ended up in the US. And I did my PhD at Georgetown University in international relations. So that was a very, very enriching experience as well. Learned a lot about not just American perspectives on international affairs, but global perspectives, because it was a center where I met people from very many countries. And that, that kept my interest. So I said, going forward, when I work, I wanted to make sure I stayed in an international environment. So following that, I actually was in Italy for two years, doing a postdoctoral degree in Florence. And now finally, <laughs> I am at the Hurti School, which um, I would strongly recommend as a very international uh, institution in the heart of Europe, where I think, again, every day I meet students from over 50 countries, and it's a very exciting and engaging environment to be in. Yeah, um, the teenager in you would, uh, would be really proud, like you would have made the 18-year-old self super proud of uh, where you ended up, right? Oh, absolutely. And honestly, looking back, I don't think I ever thought I would end up as an academic or that I would go on this very international journey, as you mentioned. Um, and I think it really was just this, this 
ongoing draw in me to try and untangle the world around us and questions about war and peace that plague our societies on a daily basis, questions about how we deal with one another as human beings uh, in ways that are very complex. And if we had answers to that, we would not have the field of political science. And so I think um, this ongoing interest has kept me engaged even today. Academic careers are super competitive um, and you've made it like, you know, with, uh, you know, with such clarity up front, we were just going to your research. Um, it seems that everything in your life uh, seems to have been super planned or discovered serendipitously, but there is no, what do you call, randomness, at least that's what uh, your CV tells us. But I'm pretty sure that's not the entirety of the story. So tell us about the randomness, the serendipity uh, in your career. That will give us well, a lot of confidence. Honestly, and that's, I think this is a really important message to everybody in any field, at any age of their life even. This isn't about just young people, right? It's that we certain life choices are made that are sometimes in our hands and sometimes not. And quite frankly, at the end, as I mentioned, I did an undergraduate degree in English literature, which has nothing to do with international relations. All I knew at the end of that was, I can't continue with this. I need to switch to a field that was more political. Um, and there was no guarantee that I would succeed, right? There's no easy pathway when you're switching disciplines. There's no easy way to convince others that you genuinely want to try something new. And it was, it was honestly serendipitous that I got into one of the leading international relations programs in India. And I thank my stars <laughs> that in some way that happened because if I hadn't had that opportunity, I hadn't made it, made it into a master's program, I would not be on the path I am today. And along the way, I will say the other thing that I was very fortunate to, to have on my side, and I think a lot of people in different fields might feel this, is having good mentors. And I think I was fortunate to encounter very good mentors along the way. And I think people were willing to share their life experiences, willing to give a helping hand. And this was true both in JNU and at Georgetown and at EUI, all the institutions that I have been in. Um, and I think now at Hurti, even as a new professor at this institution, I find a lot of support and a lot of encouragement from professors who've been here for many years who are very encouraging of me trying different different things or new things in an academic environment that's very European. And I most certainly am not European myself. So I think it's a, it, it also is good to be exposed to that kind of diversity in mentorship as well. I was at EUI in uh, uh, 2018 or 2019. I was just passing by uh, uh, Florence uh, for a conference and I met a friend. And uh, she spoke phenomenal things about her experience as a postdoc uh, there. And there's something special about each of your institutions, whether it's Delhi University, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Georgetown, EUI, and Hurti. And they all seem to have nudged you in some way to explore political entrepreneurship. Tell us how that happened. Uh, I know that it's not uh, a linear journey. No, it absolutely isn't. And I think, again, as you said, some things are serendipitous, right? And in my time in JNU, I ended up working um, with a professor, Professor Happy Mon Jacob, who is incredibly popular if you are reading and keeping up to date on Indian politics. Um, and he was working on India-Pakistan track two dialogues. And I thought that was fascinating because it was not something we see openly when it comes to diplomacy. It happens behind closed doors. It's a very, very important part of confidence building measures between two countries that are constantly openly adversarial, right? And I thought, okay, this is a very interesting avenue to sort of try and see what genuinely with good intent happens between countries when they're trying to resolve issues. So I actually got involved in helping organize these dialogues. Uh, it's something I did after I finished my master's as well for a year. And the more I sort of spent time in those spaces, the more I realized that, you know, there are systemic incentives to the ways we all behave in the world, but there are also individuals who are um, sometimes incredibly influential when we look at political outcomes and the ways in which history unfolds, right? And so that, that sort of kept my interest going. And when I was doing my PhD, um, a colleague and I got together and realized that increasingly we were noticing these patterns 
uh, particularly in diaspora communities, of how these individuals come together, rally their communities, and try to lobby for political issues that are relevant for those communities. Because in democracy, sometimes we find that um, not everybody sees that they are represented. Not everybody feels that they have a voice. So how do you get heard? You need individuals to sort of motivate and bring people together to feel that they're heard. So that was of a lot of interest. And I thought like a good functioning democracy should see um, good political entrepreneurship. And so my research interest sort of went in that direction as well, just to understand what motivates um, different, different sort of groups of people to come together, what motivates particularly individuals who are interested in foreign policy issues, since a lot of my research looks at foreign mm -hmm. policy analysis, um, to come together and lobby on issues for foreign policy or raise agendas related to foreign policy in the countries they live in. And so that's sort of how my interest has been growing in that direction. Yeah. And has uh, this diaspora network or um, made a real difference in politics in, in the UK and the US uh, in different parts of the world? Oh, absolutely. And I think there's uh, an underappreciation sometimes that, that diaspora communities are very important sources of both information and influence. And if this is not just contemporary, I think very often we just look at the world around us in the recent past. But, but if you even look at pre-independence, um, Indian communities in the US, my research has shown how there were actually Indians in the US actively coming together as political communities, as groups, to talk to members of Congress, to talk to politicians in the US, and convince them that India needed independence and that British rule was unjust and should not exist in colo colonies around the world. And it was a very, very persuasive group of people and a very influential set of, set of individuals who uh, we never read about very often in history, but actually had a lot of uh, political weight and in fact were constantly in touch with independence leaders in India and um, had an active open channel with politicians in the US who were putting pressure on the UK to give India independence after World War II. And so it's very fascinating to see how these are not new networks. These are not new phenomena. Diaspora communities have existed for centuries. Um, and they have always had a role to play politically. I see that now different um, diaspora media networks, social networks, um, subgroups writing literature, a lot of them are becoming a lot more popular. I suspect, um, you know, technology platforms have some role to play in it, but not that may not be the entire story. I'll be very interested in your perspective. No, I think you are right. I think there's a big, we have to give a lot of credit to modern technology for the ways in which um, networks and communication has become more horizontal. We no longer rely on a few rich people to set up things for us to communicate. We can actually do this on our own as individuals. Um, and we can also mobilize without relying on an institution. And I think a lot of these online platforms for diaspora communities are fantastic for this region, for this very reason, right? And I think um, going forward, you might see a lot more democratization of that space, right? I think that's what we're seeing right now, which is um, also, I think, a very positive uh, move in that direction. We, we criticize social media a lot. We criticize online platforms a lot for also being places where we can't censor very well or being places where um, increasingly we see um, very, very negative um, reactions to many things. But at the same time, we must acknowledge that it's um, allowed a lot of people who did not have access, uh, particularly not access across international boundaries in the past, who can today build these networks and can find their peers around the world. And I think that's a wonderful way to connect, um, especially if you don't have the means to travel around the world. Um, this is the way to travel around the world now. I mean, look at us, yeah. where you're sitting in a different <laughs> part of the world, and that's from me, and we can have this conversation. So this is actually a wonderful thing. So tell us a bit about your uh, a day in your life as an assistant professor at uh, at Herty. Um, so professors have a lot of work. It's not just teaching. So the first thing I would say is I and my this is my first semester teaching at Herty. 
I am teaching the introductory class on global politics. So I teach five classes a week. And so a lot of my time really goes into preparing for the class to actually plan the lectures, think about activities for students, um, also become prepared for questions they might have. So a, a good proportion of my time goes into preparing for classes. Um, and there are the classes themselves. Um, and then on top of that, it's not just, as I said, teaching. Um, I do a lot of research and research is um, actually an incredibly important part of um, the academic culture, particularly at Hurdy. So um, I spend my day helping either writing my own work, uh, I collaborate with a lot of co-authors. So um, that's also, again, an, an important reason why networks matter. Um, reaching yes. co-authors across the world uh, is very important. And I do a lot of work, which means reaching out to them, having meetings like this, um, ongoing projects that are not something we finish in a month or two, but projects that last two to three years because we have to gather data, analyze it, write about it. And um, the academic process can be very, very rigorous and very, very slow in some ways because of the rigor. So these are, these are marathon runs, not sprints. So a lot of my day just goes into dividing up time between different research projects and focusing on teaching and how to make the environment at Hurdy more fun for the students. And what are Hurdy students like? Uh, in what way are they similar or different to, say, your friends at JNU or Georgetown or, you know, any other place that you've been at? The one thing I find absolutely wonderful about a Hurdy classroom, and I was very pleasantly surprised by this when I started teaching, is how international the student body is. We're not a very big university, but despite that, we have very, very highly qualified and diverse students. So, I mean, I'm teaching the, the first years for the Masters in International Affairs. And in my classroom, we counted, I think we're over 50, we're from over 50 different countries. So we have over like 50 nationalities, all represented in one classroom. And that what that allows you to do, and I think I said this at the beginning, is put yourself in an international environment where you're exposed to so many perspectives, you hear ideas you've never heard of before. And I say that as a teacher, right? I, even though I have spent, as I told you, so time in many different international contexts, on a daily basis at Hurdy, I'm still exposed to new ideas, new concepts, um, interesting research designs and projects coming from the students. And I think because of that diversity, because of the environment which allows people from very different backgrounds to come together, um, you also have this ability to grow as a person, and both for students and for the professors. And I think that's a very nice, um, unique thing about Hurdy School. So I've been noticing carefully since uh, um, 2017 how the interest uh, of Indian students in Hurdy has been growing year by year. So somebody hosted me, a student hosted me for an interview in 2017. Um, this friend of mine was, I think, then thinking of doing India-centric conferences organized by Hurti. Uh, and, and now um, that happens uh, a lot more frequently. There's so many more alums. Um, tell us about uh, the growth and plans of uh, Hurti in India. Uh, you're absolutely right. That's a, we have seen a growth in the number of Indian students coming to the Hurdy School. We also have been actively engaging in India because, I mean, as an Indian, I say this very proudly, I think we produce some very, very intellectual and excellent student bodies that are not just about coming to study, but also very dedicated to applying what they study in the real world. And I think another point about the Hurdy School is that we're not just focused on theory or teaching you about abstract ideas, we genuinely want you to go and do good work in the world out there, right? So it's a more practical approach to, to understanding public policy or international affairs or data science, which are all the master's programs that we offer. And so I think for the, for the, the focus on India, I think we really genuinely want more students because we've seen fantastic students from there who are very engaged uh, really do care about giving back to society. And I think we are trying really hard also to show them that they can gain a lot from an international experience in Berlin. We're an English language school, so language is not a problem in a very mm -hmm. diverse city in the heart of Europe. So there are a lot of things that 
I think are really, really um, good combination for those coming from India. And I think that um, going forward, you will see more engagement in terms of conferences being held in India. So if there's interest in that, we welcome anybody to come participate. We just held a conference in October on the future of healthcare. Well, we had some yeah. fascinating discussions in Delhi and in Bangalore about uh, looking at, oh, how in the future are we going to use artificial intelligence to sort of create platforms for centralizing healthcare in India, where this is a genuinely important issue for low-income households, right? And so how are we going to do this? And these are, you know, really important conversations to be having, but also exciting research that we're sharing with one another. So I would say, look, going forward, we're just going to see more of this um, as the years progress. Um, I remember the healthcare conference, a bunch of network capital community members were super excited. I think it's, it's saw Herty alumni and professors and students all come together in this conference. And uh, I think events like these give the opportunity for the entire you know alumni community to get forged. Um, what was that really like? Because I know you were uh, on some panels, uh, leading some discussions. How does a um, uh, you know, political science policy professor uh, think about, you know, health tech innovations and how do you prep for such conferences? To be fair, this is not my area of expertise. Um, another professor at, at our university, uh, Professor Mujahid Sheikh, he's the one who actually spearheaded this conference and is the expert on healthcare and future of healthcare technology as an economist. Um, and I think... Uh, the more technical aspects, I will let him answer. But for myself, I will say what I thought was really, really engaging about this platform is something that I think reflects even Hertie's motto, which is interdisciplinarity. It wasn't just um, political scientists there. It wasn't just data scientists there. It wasn't just policymakers there. It was rather that all of us were coming together to give our different expertise on different dimensions of healthcare, and then trying to come to an integrated holistic solution to what the future is going to look like, right? Because mm -hmm. there are people like me who come from a more political science background who are talking about um, how do we get um, the democratic uh, mandate to, to sort of like have data which is both protected, but at the same time allows individuals to collect information on themselves. Then there are um, artificial intelligence experts who are talking about the actual mechanisms of the technology themselves and how do we create these platforms. Then there are economists who are crunching the numbers and telling you what projections will look like, right? So these are very different areas of expertise. Um, and what I noticed in this conference, which I, I think, again, if there are conferences in the future, I assume this will be the, the way in which we conduct them, it's that we bring together all of these very different um, research backgrounds to sort of bring together ideas that are not just economists, not just for social science, political science, but rather more holistic picture of what policy can look like in the future and how we can all pool our different strengths for that. You know, I really like this uh, concept of deep generalist, um, this kind of person who who knows how to go deep, but knows how to go broad as well. And even though, uh, to some sense, you are obviously a specialist in your field, but uh, like I really admire that you often have to dabble across healthcare, pick up new things, organize, be a curator at times. And I think this is really important for policy professionals now. You can't just be a person who knows one thing. It just doesn't add up in the uh, in the world today. Do you try and teach that uh, deep generalist principle to your students in some shape or form? Does it make sense at all? Oh, absolutely. And I think that was my point about our focus on being interdisciplinary. It's that we, I think, generally believe that having area. I mean, having having specialization is great, and always in depth knowledge. We should never devalue that. But at the same time. Um, we can't be siloed into spaces where we don't have conversations across different disciplines. We also must acknowledge that we are, as of today, being faced with some very critical challenges in a global sense, like just look at environment, look at climate change. And you cannot solve these very, very pressing concerns uh, by only speaking to your own discipline. We are in a stage, particularly when it comes to policy making, where we need as I said, to borrow strengths from different areas of expertise to sort of come together and create innovative solutions. And I think 
that is the emphasis in all of our classrooms, not just where I, well, me, me teaching a global politics class, but I think every Hurti professor brings that into their classroom with this idea that, yes, we all may come from specialized PhDs, um, but at the same time, we are very aware that um, in the broader world, we need solutions that are not just focused on a narrow question, but can speak more broadly. Can you talk to us a bit about the diaspora networks being formed in and around Hurti, in and around Berlin that you've observed? We'll be particularly interested in the India diaspora networks. Oh, no, that's a great question. But I, as I just arrived here myself, I would say that I can see that there is a very strong and healthy Indian community in Berlin, which is rapidly expanding. Um, and I think this is there's no, from as, as far as I have seen, no formal institutionalization of this network or this community as yet, um, but it's growing rapidly. It's a very strong community. I think it's um, wonderful to see even the Indian embassy here engaging with us. In, and as of last month, they invited all the Indian students at Hurti to come. Um, talk to them, and they also gave very good advice on like being a diaspora community, especially as students um, in a different country. As for many students, it's the first time that they're living abroad. So it was very, it was very nice to see that there's this very active community that's engaged um, in the environment here locally as well. So uh, from what I can say, I will say this is that for the next two years uh, or the next five years, I, I estimate and project that these numbers are going to double or triple and that it's going to just yeah. get stronger year by year. Uh, we've seen that as well. A network capital is obviously an international platform. We also have a chapter in Berlin, but we are constantly seeing the number of uh, South Asian folks, Indian folks that has uh, been growing consistently. And uh, I wouldn't say uh, like London because London has quite a lot more people but there are some patterns that are becoming very similar like aggregation around food festivals or games or you know coming together um, for political lobbying you know directly or indirectly we haven't seen that too much before but now uh, you know there are some sparks so perhaps you know people should read uh, your research and uh, try and apply it I want to understand uh, the job market uh, of, uh, for Indians, um, you know, after Hurti or while they're at Hurti looking for internships and practical projects. What does that really look like and how do professors, if at all, uh, be helpful in that process? So there's one thing to keep in mind is that the, the two-year master's program that we offer has what is called a professional year inbuilt as an extra or a third year, which you can take between the two years. Um, and what this allows you to do is do an internship or work somewhere, not just in Germany or anywhere in the world. And we facilitate that as an institution for you. And so you get work experience while doing your degree. Like I said, we're very oriented towards being practical as a public policy school. So that is something where you can already start as you're studying in, in different parts or different institutions um, in your areas of interest. Um, and very often I've noticed that students who start in a program during their professional year or go um, work in an institution during their professional year um, end up working in those spaces after they graduate with their master's program because um, very often they have such a good experience or also they impress um, their employers so much that they are invited back in fact to continue working in those spaces. So the opportunity to work is almost immediate as you get here. At the end of your first year, you can already start looking for that professional year job. Um, and I think that's a great way to also explore options outside of one's country, it's not even just in Germany and other parts of the world as well, because we facilitate that. And I think from what I've seen is that many, many students also go back to their countries of origin. Um, Indian students go back to India and actually work in the public policy sectors that need a lot of input, that need innovative ideas and solutions. And they're doing a great job in especially working with NGOs, working with think tanks, working for the government. And I think those are, it's very uplifting to see that you take all of these skills and then apply them in society as well. Yeah, and one thing the pandemic did was uh, it really highlight the importance of career transitions and long internships really help and you know, jobs after uh, really help you move from sector A to sector B or change the nature of your work 
and uh, it's good to see the school uh, prepare students for it. I was uh, I mean, also- sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to point out one more thing that the one of the advantages of coming to Germany, particularly if you're coming from India or a non-EU country, is that um, on completing a degree here, you also get 18 months of a work permit where you don't even need to have a job. You get to look for a job um, over 18 months if you so choose and you can start working with that work permit before you transition into a full work permit. So if you are actually interested in working in Germany, that's definitely something that's easy to transition to if you have um, a degree from a German university. Yeah, and 18 months is a reasonable time. I think two months, four months, these, this makes it too difficult for people um, you know, to look for jobs. 18 months, I think, is, is pretty reasonable. Absolutely. Um, I was noticing that in the pandemic, um, there were people who were going back to school looking for different kinds of education experiences. Older, younger people were uh, looking at air studying options as well. So what does Herty or what do schools like Herty um, think of creating smaller degrees or different degrees for different sets of people? Can you walk us through the thought process of the various education programs in the school? So we offer three master's programs, which are the master's in international affairs, the master's in public policy, and the master's in data science. And as of now, the reason we're focusing only on these three is that within these three, we actually have a lot of variety on what students can choose to specialize in. I can speak for the Masters of International Affairs since I'm teaching that course, where we are, our students can specialize in international security, in European governance, or in human rights and global governance. And these are such diverse fields that within international security, you can opt to study about something as mainstream as understanding war and peace to the more new cutting edge research on cybersecurity, on trying to understand um, resources and, the, and how this can have an effect on uh, degrading security in many countries around the world. So there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of diversity in how you can approach these subjects, uh, even within these three uh, masters that we offer. I mean, for European governance within masters in international affairs, I know students who do very mainstream research from looking at the European Commission or trying to understand the European Parliament to more interest, I mean, I would say more diverse topics like um, understanding the role of the EU in climate change negotiations or understanding the EU's relationships with different parts of the world. So, you know, students have that liberty to sort of pursue what they find interesting, what they think is relevant for them, right? And I know those who in our third area of specialization on human rights and global governance, you see research from very serious issues of um, employing child soldiers in conflict zones to issues about using children in the labor market. Um, and so we have a lot of diversity when it comes to what students can opt into and what they want to specialize mm. in. Um, so that way, actually, it's not about being narrow in terms of offering very narrowly defined master's uh, degrees, but rather keeping it broad so that students can have the liberty to choose what they actually eventually write a master's thesis on, what they want to specialize in, what they would like to sort of go do a deep dive into. Yeah. And um, what does the teaching methodology look like? Do you do you have a case study based approach in class, or uh, is it totally up to the professor to include, say, current events and help uh, students analyze them or look at the past? What does the classroom experience actually feel like? So this again is completely up to the professor because we encourage um, very smaller classrooms. So all professors will never have a class that's more than I would say 25 people. Um, and sometimes even if we are forced to do a lecture for a larger group, discussions are always with much smaller groups. So the idea and the pedagogy at, at the core is based on discussion and debate. And having said that, the way we interpret that as individual professors is very different. And obviously depends on the subject being taught. Um, there's a lot more debate that can take place in a global politics class as opposed to a statistics <laughs> class. Especially now. So, you know, yeah. there's, there's, it also depends on what the topic at hand is. Um, but one thing we, we, we will, I should mention is that we are very 
eclectic and open to a variety of methods when it comes to studying the world and understanding the world. So we will teach you how to use quantitative statistical methods mm. to analyze data. And this is incredibly important going forward when we are amassing large quantities of data and like we don't have a good way of analyzing them. We also do very qualitative in-depth case studies, right? Sometimes reflecting real world events as they unfold, speaking of like Russia and Ukraine right now, or the rise of China right now, which are very pertinent topics in global politics. So we would do a deep dive into that. Um, so we're actually very open and we try and teach as many methods as possible to our students. Students have the liberty to sort of pursue whichever methodological approach that is of interest to them. Um, but we do try to make sure that they have a more rounded uh, approach to understand yeah. the world. You are training policymakers, politicians, uh, international affairs professionals uh, of tomorrow. Are you teaching them how to disagree? Absolutely. And I think that's one of the most critical skills to learn. Because in our classroom, and I said this, at the, at the core of our pedagogy is the idea of debate and discussion, right? And the first thing I say to my students in the first class that I ever have with them is, you must realize that you are all colleagues and that you come from very, very different backgrounds with probably very op strong opinions on some issues which are polar opposites. So you have to learn to express your opinions. You have to learn to debate for what you believe in without being disrespectful to others in this classroom. And at the same time, be open-minded and willing to engage with perspectives and points of views that you may A, have never heard before, or B, have always disagreed with, but you need to sort of show and in a, in a logical manner how and why you disagree with that. And what is the merit to your own arguments that you're making, right? And so absolutely dealing with an environment where there is no consensus, it is very likely that people you're very good friends with actually lie on the opposite side of a particular issue is more common than you realize. And I think right. making them very comfortable with that and making them aware of that from the beginning is something we emphasize. Right. In your own life, uh, can you walk us through uh, an issue or something where you've changed your mind or changed your perspective on something? Um, we ask this to uh, everyone we host about rethinking. And this, mm -hmm. uh, this is not to restrict you to policy or something you teach, but about anything. I think I was, it was growing up, I, I think I never, I was never willing to, to, as I said, what I now tell my students to do, I was never willing to be very open-minded about opinions that I thought were um, very, very different from mine. And I think the process of, of, of a rigorous academic um, career that I've had has forced me very often to consider and evaluate positions that I originally never would have been sympathetic to. And what I've learned, and I think this is a very tough skill to learn, and I don't even think I do it well now, but that's something I try to do, is sometimes, be it, be it politics, be it uh, about social values, be it about um, even petty things like uh, your opinion on a movie. Um, sometimes you might, you, might, you might feel very strongly about something. You might encounter friends, family, colleagues who feel very differently about it. And I think in the past, I would have been very dismissive. I would have been very condescending uh, about those opinions. But today I have learned to, to appreciate that humans are complex. We come from very different backgrounds. We cannot know what each individual has gone through on their journey. We also cannot know what, how they, each individual has been socialized, what they've been exposed to, what their experiences are in the world. So we need to be a little more understanding and need to be a little more circumspect about and at least appreciating that not everybody is going to have the same opinion as you. And that's okay, yeah. right? And I think that, that 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 little bit of distance from taking everything personally and being very dismissive has been a big change in my own character. Yeah, if consensus were the goal, why come to a learning institution? The whole point for a student or an academic is to come to change their mind, to, to fine tune their research. Absolutely. And I think and I think the one thing, as I said, is that 
in classroom environments, in, in even just pure faculty environments, um, you will always be surrounded by people who have opinions that are not aligned with yours. Um, and the point isn't to sort of draw boundaries and make a, make a system of camps or us versus them. It is in fact to try and build bridges across these various positions and try and understand why people come from very different positions and why they hold the opinions they hold. And, uh, and to have that open debate and dialogue to try and persuade maybe change if you believe in that change. Um, and sometimes realize you also change in the process of that dialogue and that's okay. Okay, awesome. So uh, I know you're still new at Hurti. I mean, relatively new at Hurti, relatively perhaps new at Berlin as well. Is there a very fond memory, not, not related to teaching or researching, that you'd like to share with uh, the listeners, many of whom will end up Hurti in the years to come? Well, actually, it is a teaching moment that I would like to share where um, I was very anxious and nervous about starting as a new professor, teaching a very tough subject as global, global politics to 100 students. Um, and in my second week, a student actually came up to me and said, wow, I, I have studied international relations for so many years, and this is the first time you've made me question my opinions, and I feel like my world has been flipped upside down. And that, was, that felt like a compliment. That was the, the, one of my defining moments where I felt, all right, I think I'm in the right profession and I'm doing something right because it was the, the, the goal of any professor is to make students come out of their comfort zones, to make them realize that very often in many educational systems, we are taught to just read the text or just listen to the professors without questioning them, without having an opinion on them, um, and that to take what's written as fact, whereas most of what's written is not fact. It is, it is constantly up for debate, right? And I thought that was a really, really good moment to realize that all my effort to, to show my students that they should be very critical of what they are shown as fact um, was paying off. I love that your student actually uh, rethought his or her opinion and uh, you enabled her, that person to do it. Um, really appreciate your time. You should absolutely do this again. Uh, I think a lot of people on Network Capital would be fascinated by your research on political entrepreneurship uh, and the diaspora network, especially now where a lot is happening globally uh, when it comes to diaspora network. Um, really appreciate your time and uh, hope to have you back soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Utkarsh. This was great.